Good morning, church family. Uh, it is a joy to be a part of this family uh, baptism today. I'd love to introduce to you Landry Holder and her mom, Jennifer, this morning. While at FCA camp last summer, uh, Landry was moved and convicted during the worship times. And later that night while she was at home, she knew that it was time for her to surrender her life to the Lord. So she prayed, repented of her sin, and trusted in Jesus as her Savior. And her aunt, Donna Smith, uh, was a big part, played a very active role in SCA through the years and she passed away a few years ago but how sweet that uh, her Aunt Donna got to lead so many young people to Christ through FCA and I thought how fitting that the Holy Spirit moved in Landry's life during FCA camp last year so he is so good so good Landry I have a couple of questions for you have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? Do you believe that Jesus came, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross for your sins and on the third day rose from the grave? Have you trusted in him and you're going to walk in obedience according to his word? Amazing. Well, based on that confession of faith, it's your mom's privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in new life with him. And this is, uh, for, for all of us, Sam, it's an exciting day to be able to celebrate uh, salvation together. During, uh, during COVID was a, was a tough time for, for many of us. And he was uh, at a place, in, at a, it was a church in Scottsville, and he recognized um, his need for a Savior. He, and he recognized that that Savior is Jesus. And so, Sam, have you made a profession of faith? Do you believe that Jesus came and lived a perfect life, um, died and was raised again on the third day and is coming back again? Yes. And will you trust him and serve him as your Lord and Savior for the rest of your life? Yes. And so then your father and brother in Christ gets to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in the new life in What a joy it is for us to begin the Lord's Day that way, of remarking some people coming to new life in Christ. We want to see that happen here in our community and around the globe. So we're going to begin this morning also by commissioning this team. They're headed for West Africa. They're going to be training about 50 pastors there, what it means to have a healthy church, uh, to live out the realities of Christ. So we're excited for them to go leaving this Friday. Join me as we pray and send them. Let's, let's bless them as they go. Now, Father, we thank you. Uh, that you are a God who works miracles of bringing people from death to life, both here in Bowling Green and around the world. And we pray for this team as they go to West Africa. And we pray, Lord, for traveling mercies as they go there and back. Keep them healthy and strong. It's going to be really hot while they're there, so I pray you'd encourage them in that way. And then, Father, while they're there and they're engaging with these local pastors and even others that are there, we pray that through their work and their teaching and their encouragement, that your redemptive purposes will take one more step uh, toward fulfilling what you intend for them to be. So I pray you bless and encourage them as they work with our partners and the pastors that are there. And Lord, we look forward to them coming back and telling us stories of how your kingdom is at work on the other side of the world. We're grateful and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, listen, we're so glad you're here this morning to worship the Lord with us. We welcome you, especially if you're a guest with us today. Thank you so much for joining with our faith family today as we worship Jesus together. If you are a first-time guest, I'd like to ask you to take that orange card that is in the pew in front of you. Fill that out. At the end of our gathering, take it back here to, uh, to our Guest Connect uh, right in the middle of the lobby. We have a special gift for you. Love to get to know you. Put a name and a face together. Also, you can write down prayer concerns. You also can do that on the QR code. Take a picture of that, and you can do the exact same thing in a digital way. You can let us know about you and just go right back here as well. And let us know how we, can also, how we can pray for you, how we can see the Lord working around you. It's our great privilege to be able to do that. One of our ministries we've been excited about over the last year is uh, what we call Ministers in Training, MIT at Living Hope. We have two tracks, a church ministries track, deals with ministries here, and then our vocational track for in the workplace, disciples in the workplace. Let's watch this video, see a little bit about that. Well, my name is Doug Kembler. I'm the treatment plant superintendent for Bowling Green Municipal Utilities. My responsibilities are managing the water treatment plant, the water recovery facility here in town. Uh, first thing I've learned through ministers and training and the vocational track is that I wasn't nearly focused enough on kingdom work when I was at work. I didn't 
I didn't really combine the two. Uh, they were, it was almost like they were siloed, one in one area of my life and one in another area of my life. And that's not right. That's not how it's supposed to be. It should be, they should be commingled, and it should just be one whole as part of your life. I really never considered that my vocation, kingdom vocation, could be as applicable as it is in my earthly vocation, running this plant. And that's become really more apparent. Every class I take, I'm able to see more clearly how I can support the kingdom and what's happening in kingdom work about what I do during my everyday. And so it's really refocused me and it's refocused my walk. We do a really good job of training people on Sunday and then we send them out into the world. And we don't do a good job of showing people how their earthly vocation meshes in with our kingdom mission. And so by providing the training through this class, Living Hope has really kind of motivated me, inspired me, and I think that anybody who could take this class is going to benefit in that same way. I want to encourage everybody to sign up and be a member of the next cohort. It's a great opportunity to learn more about yourself, learn more about your, your walk with God, to make a good group of friends that you can, you can get with and share experiences with and just develop a new appreciation for what the plan really is. Know is that every Lord's Day there are thousands of people across our community who give no thought for God and are not in our churches. But those same people in the other days of the week are right next to Living Hope Disciples in the workplace where they are. Ministers in Training is designed to develop transformational kingdom leaders for the good of the church and the world. And in our vocational track, we're looking to help ordinary Christians just like you in all kinds of working spheres, in retail, and education, and business, and manufacturing, and all kinds of other workplaces, begin to live out the intersection of their faith and their work, to explore what it means to see how God intended work uh, to work for us, and how our work is actually a part of our being faithful to Jesus and, uh, and extending the mission in that way. So we do want to encourage you to pray about joining our next cohort of our vocational track. It begins in July. July, got a few months left uh, to do that. Uh, we look forward to having a group of people just meet together, have some great conversations, some fascinating perspectives. You meet once a month, there's some work to do beforehand, and we look forward to seeing you be a part of that. So we encourage you to pray about that, join with us. You can go to livehopeful.com and make your application to be a part of our next cohort of our vocational discipleship training through MIT. Well, let's worship the Lord as we come this morning. Let's pray together. So, Lord, we recognize this morning that you are the king over all things. You're the king over hearts. You're the king over nations. You're the king over vocations. You're the king over workplaces. You're the king over communities. And, Lord, this morning as we come, we bring lots of things in here, lots of stories that we've experienced this week. But in these next few moments, would you focus our minds and our hearts on you? Would you help us delight in you and make much of you and see all that we are and all that we do in light of who you are and that you have come and given yourself for us. We love you. We worship you as your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand with us this morning as we begin our time of worship? First Chronicles says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are to be exalted as head above all. Let's do that this morning. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. He, see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. some great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom away. 
again. Give him your praise today. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, he's unshakable. worship you this morning. Move among your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's lift up his name and worship him today.
Father, we do come before you this morning to praise you as the God of our salvation, the one who has planned from before the foundation of the world. In conjunction with the Spirit and the Son, made a plan to bring rebel sinners just like us, to wash us clean of sin and to bring us into your family. And we praise you, Son, God the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, for accomplishing that plan that was set forth by the Father before the foundation of the world, to live as a, a, a sacrifice, and to die as a sacrifice and to rise as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we praise you, Spirit, for your work in giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to believe, giving us the faith to repent of sin and trust in the gospel. We thank you for accomplishing and applying the work of Christ to us. Lord, this morning we've gathered together to be reminded of these wonderful truths, but also to praise you and to now move into a time where we're going to study your word together. And so we ask you, Lord, that you would do what you can do, that you would, by the work of your spirit, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would enlighten our minds to these wonderful truths that we may behold wonderful things out of your law. Teach us, Lord. Help us to understand who our Father is and who that makes us to be. Help us to see you rightly, to see you truly, and help us to leave this place this morning just so unbelievably grateful for all that you have done for us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's great to be with you this morning as we study God's Word together. We've been studying uh, this year, we've been talking about the good news, the good news of the gospel. And we've been looking at some of the Apostle Paul's letters uh, to understand the, the good news of the gospel. We studied Galatians earlier, earlier this year. We're studying the book of Ephesians right now. We're going to study Philippians and Colossians in the few months to come. In this book of Ephesians, we're talking about uh, the gospel. And again, remember what the gospel is. You, you have heard this before, but I want to remind you again that the gospel is the power of God to save us from the punishment and the power of sin. When we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, we're able to have peace. We embrace this gospel because we have peace with God, which allows us to have peace within and makes us able to have peace with others. Unfortunately, this is not the only gospel that exists. There are other gospels out there. Gospel simply means good news. So there's the gospel of achievement. If I can just do enough good things, if I can just have these successes in my life, then maybe that will fill this, this void that I have. Or maybe it's the gospel of religion and morality, that if I can just be a good person and do good things, that somehow I can wash away all of my sin, all the filth. There's other gospels out there, but there is only one gospel that saves, only one gospel that provides forgiveness 
and freedom and fulfills uh, all these longings that we have, helps us to have this sense of the fullness of joy. And it's the gospel of God that comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But it's important that we understand what gospel we believe. We said this uh, every Sunday so far this year, that the gospel you believe determines the life that you live. And it's so important that we get the gospel right, because if we get the wrong gospel, then we'll get everything else wrong. But in our study of Ephesians, we've been talking about how the good news of the gospel, it allows us as Christians, as believers, to know the plans and the desires that God has revealed for his people. You know, our God is a planner. And uh, in, the book of Galatia, I'm sorry, in the book of Ephesians, what we're going to see this morning is that God has made a plan for our salvation. Before the foundation of the world, in perfect union with the Son and the Spirit, he made a plan to save us. He made a plan to redeem us. You know, in my life, I would consider myself to be a planner. I've planned a lot of things in my life. Um, I, when I was growing up, I had a plan. Uh, I wanted to be an NBA basketball player. And then I realized that I'm about 5'7", and I'm round, and I can't jump. And I can shoot okay, but I cannot play at the level of the NBA. So I realized that. So that plan failed. So I made it a second plan. I wanted to go to be a doctor. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, of all things. Smartest people in the world. I wanted to join their ranks. Uh, I made a plan, and then I realized, one, I'm not smart enough, and two, I don't want to spend the next 30 years of my life in school. So that plan failed. And then I made another plan. I wanted to be a businessman. I went to college to get a finance degree, and God made it very clear to me that he had a different plan for my life. And now I'm here as a pastor. And what I have learned over the course of my life, over the 27 years that I've lived, is that uh, as good of a planner as I think that I am, that I'm actually a really bad planner. That not only can I not see the plans that I have, uh, I can't see them through, but that sometimes my plans are, are wrong. Not so with God. God's plans are always right. God's plans are always good. And God's, God never fails to accomplish his plan. And what we're seeing again in, this, in the text this morning is that in eternity past, God made a plan for our salvation. And over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about now, God's plan of salvation, of, of what God has done to save us. And we're going to look at what this plan of salvation reveals to us about God the Father, about God the Son, and about God the Holy Spirit. This morning, we're specifically focusing on the Father. But one of the, the really cool, but also kind of mind-boggling, but also really exciting truths about the God of the Bible is that he is a God who is triune. He's a, he is a, a God who is a, a trinity. There's a very simple uh, way to understand this, that the God of the Bible is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. I've tried for a lot of years to come up with an illustration, as have many people, uh, to explain the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and we're not going to dig all the way into it today, um, but there is no illustration. The God of the Bible is unique. He is utterly unlike anyone or anything that we know. The God of the Bible is not one God who shows up in three different ways, like uh, he shows up as Father, as Son, as Spirit, and he's just really one being. That's not what the Bible says. That's actually a heresy called modalism. And that was dealt with way, way, way back in church history. To swing to the other side, uh, there are some people who say, well, their understanding of the Trinity is, well, it must just be three gods. God the Father is a God, God the Son is a God, and God the Spirit is a God. Well, well what, that's, a, that's a problem. That's called polytheism. And that's a problem because it, it, it denies the, the unity of the Trinity. So what we have to do is, as much as we have a trouble understanding this, is we have to understand that the God of the Bible is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And I know that this may seem overwhelming, and it is a little bit, but I want to encourage you in the fact that if you are overwhelmed, that's a good thing. A finite mind should not be able to comprehend an infinite God. And the fact that our finite minds have a hard time wrapping them around, uh, wrapping around these truths about God should remind us that God is far bigger and far greater than anything that we could dream up on our own. But at the same time, what we do know about God is that though we can't know him fully, we can know him truly. We can know him as he's revealed himself to us in his word. And over, again, over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about how God has revealed himself. And specifically this morning, we're going to talk about how God the Father has revealed himself to us in his plan of salvation. So if you're able and willing, would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1? And I'm going to invite Lily to come read for us. She's going to read verses 3 through 6. So once you flip there, if you wouldn't mind, stand with us in honor of God's word. And Lily, whenever you're ready, take it away. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Lily. You can be seated. So in our text this morning, we're going to see three ways that God our Father has revealed himself to us through his planning of salvation. That God has blessed us, the Father has blessed us, he has chosen us, and he has adopted us. And he's done all of this for his glory. So if you want to take a note, uh, you can make a note of this first. That God the Father reveals himself as the one who has blessed us with spiritual blessings. God the Father has revealed himself as the one who has blessed us with spiritual blessings. A few years ago uh, on social media, there was a trend going around. It was called hashtag blessed. People were posting pictures of things in their life that uh, made them feel blessed. Maybe it was somebody who had brought something to them or maybe just something that uh, maybe was a picture of their family and they were just grateful for. Uh, But that was going around social media and it probably still exists some today. Uh, But Holly and I, my wife Holly and I, got to experience a hashtag blessed moment uh, a few weeks ago. Our son Liam was born, uh, and we, we came home and immediately were greeted with food. Uh, and for six weeks, every other day, we had somebody from our church family bringing us food to our house. We didn't have to cook. We didn't have to clean it. We just took it out of the fridge, and we ate it. And then uh, when we were done, we threw all the, the, the trash in the, in the trash can. Uh, but for six weeks, we ate like kings and queens. We had every casserole that exists we had breakfast foods, we had steaks, we ate dessert every night, right? This was a, a very much a, a hashtag blessed moment for us. Uh, it was great. And what we see the Apostle Paul doing here at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, is reveling in this hashtag blessed moment for every person who is a Christian. He says that God the Father has blessed us. And notice there is a clue as to what this blessing is. It, it's past tense. So this is a, a past tense. He has blessed us. And he says he's blessed us in Christ, meaning that Christ is the conduit. He, he's the conduit for with, uh, from which this blessing comes to us. It comes to us through our union with him. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So we can use those clues and put them together to understand what is this spiritual blessing. It's the blessing of our salvation. You know, in ancient Greek, uh, this sentence, actually Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, that paragraph that you see in your Bible, it's split up into multiple sentences in our Bibles. It was actually one sentence, 257 words. It's as long as the Gettysburg Address, all directed toward what this spiritual blessing is. We don't have time to cover all of it this morning, but we will over the next few weeks. But just to kind of give you a, a large overview of what these blessings are, In verse 4, we're going to talk about this, that we've been blessed from eternity past. Before the foundation of the world, God chose us. In verse 5, we've been blessed by being predestined for adoption. We've been brought into the family of God. In verse 7, we've been blessed with forgiveness through the blood of Christ. Verse 9 through 10, we've been blessed with the knowledge of God's plan for the fullness of time. God has revealed to us what he has been doing, is doing, and will do until Christ returns. We can know for a fact what God is up to. In verse 11, we see that we've been blessed with an inheritance. We've been blessed with a home in heaven with Jesus. And in verse 13 through 14, we've been blessed with the indwelling spirit of God who seals us and guarantees our salvation. Again, these blessings that the Apostle Paul is talking about, he's talking about the blessings that come through faith in Christ. But the point I want us to really dwell on this morning or really kind of really just let sink in is the fact that, that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He hasn't blessed us with some or just a few. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In other words, God is not stingy with his blessings. There's a a woman, a friend that shared an illustration with me this week. Uh, There's a woman named Hetty Green who died at the turn of the 20th century. She, uh, over the course of her life, she turned uh, a little bit of money that was given to her as an inheritance into what is today about two and a half billion dollars through the stock market. Back in the day, uh, back in her time, women didn't really do much with the financial industry, and so she became kind of an industry titan. But what she was known for uh, was for being very, very stingy. Being very stingy, she was sort of generous at at times, uh, but she was pretty stingy with her resources. So there's a couple of different stories. One of them, uh, I read that she didn't turn on, she didn't pay for hot water because she didn't want to have the bill. 
when she went to work, she wore the same dress every day to work so that she wouldn't have to buy new ones or many of them. And once that dress had holes in it, then she would go and buy another one and do the same thing with that. Same thing with shoes. There's another story that said that uh, she didn't want to use electricity, so she heated up her, her bowl of oatmeal that she ate every morning off of the radiator in the room instead of cooking it over the stove or over a fire. There's another story uh, which people debate if it's true or not, but the, the point remains she had a, a son who was about seven years old and was involved in a sledding accident, broke his leg, and she didn't want to pay for the, the, uh, the doctor to come fix it or set it or whatever, and so the boy ended up having to have his leg amputated. You know, what we see there with her, so she had the ability and the capacity to bless everybody's socks off, but she chose to, to not do that for whatever reason or another. Well, Siri's talking to me. <laughs> she chose not to, to do a lot with the, the blessing that she had. She was very stingy. And I want us to remember this morning that God is not stingy with his blessings. He has not been stingy at all with his blessing. I love this invitation in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. It says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. You know, the gospel message is an invitation into the blessing of God. It's an invitation into salvation. And it's a salvation that comes to us freely without cost because it was planned by the Father from before the foundation of the world that the price for our salvation would be paid for in full by Christ the Son. It's an invitation so we get to come by and we get to come experience and we get to come and be blessed with this salvation because Christ has paid it all. Jesus has paid it all. And so let me encourage you this morning to, to just revel in these blessings, to revel in this blessing of salvation. That if you've been saved, to understand that God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing that you could ever need. Yeah, as I was thinking about um, just the, the, the connection here between Holly and I enjoying the, the food that we were brought and the way that we are to respond and just to delight in this understanding of the salvation that we have in Christ. It's the same. It's the same. Just like we enjoyed that food, just like we celebrated it and we rejoiced that we had it, so should we with our blessing of salvation. That God is a, he's a, a gracious blesser. God wants to give his blessing. So let me encourage you to ask for it. Ask him to give you his blessing. He, he's gracious with his salvation. Ask him for salvation and you'll be saved. If you're here this morning, you've never experienced salvation. Ask him to. He's promised that he will. Ask him for guidance. This is one of the great ministries of the Holy Spirit is that he leads us. When we want to know how to go, how to live in God's way and his will, he, he makes it known to us. Ask him for joy. And he'll remind you once again of who you are as his. He doesn't expect us to earn it. That's what makes it grace. Grace is a, it's an unmerited benefit, unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. He is gracious to give it. So ask him for it. But he's also generous with his blessing. He lavishes it on us. You know, there's, there's no part of us, past, present, or future, in which salvation has not covered us. You know, the, the scriptures talk about salvation in a past tense, that we have been saved. The scriptures talk about salvation in the present tense, that you are being saved. And the scriptures talk about a future salvation that will be ours when we have been saved. And what the scriptures remind us of, they tell us, is that our salvation from past, present, and future has been covered. We have been covered head to toe, all of our body, all of our life, all of our shame and sin and guilt. All of it has been covered by his blessing, by the blessing of salvation. It's an abundance of mercy. It's an abundance of grace. It's an abundance of love. It's an abundance of forgiveness. God is not stingy with his blessing. He's not stingy with his blessing of salvation. He's not stingy with his blessing for those of us who have been saved. God is never short on his blessings. His well, it, it never runs dry. And so that's the first thing that we need to understand about our, our Father this morning, that God the Father is a generous and a gracious blesser. That he, if you are in Christ, he has blessed us in the past. He is continuing to bless us now. And he will continue to bless us until he calls us home. That's who he is. But then secondly, we see in this text that God the Father reveals himself as the one who's chosen us for transformation. He's chosen us for transformation. And we see this here in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, that Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, 
that we should be holy and blameless before him. And I told you guys that I wanted to be an NBA basketball player. It was my dream to be able to go and hear uh, Adam Silver or whoever the NBA commissioner is call my name and say that I've been selected by the whatever team with the first overall pick in the whatever draft. That wasn't a realistic plan for my life. But there have been a few moments in my life where I have felt in the same way that those guys have felt when I understand that I've been chosen for something special. The first one was May 26th, 2018. Holly and I made our vows over in the chapel. And as we stood there and I realized that I had like, once again way out kicked my punk coverage, that wasn't new news to me there, but it was made uh, unbelievably clear to me in that moment that I certainly did not deserve a relationship with her. I certainly didn't deserve to be married to her. She could have found a lot better looking guys and guys that could have done a lot better things than I have. But the fact that she gave that vow to me and she said, I choose you. I choose you out of all these people in the world and I choose you for now and I choose you for the rest of my life. And it made me feel like a million bucks to know that she had chosen to love me. And then the second one, uh, that, that was probably the, maybe the second greatest day of my life. And then the next greatest day of my life was uh, about eight weeks ago, February 26, 2023. Uh, we were in the, the hospital room and the doctor delivered our son, Liam, and she handed him to me. She said, here you go, dad. And she said, do you want to cut the cord? And I was totally overwhelmed. Like, I don't deserve, I don't deserve this. I don't know what I'm doing. There are other people who are much more fit to be a dad than I am. But then it sank, it sank in. God chose me to be Liam's dad. And for the rest of my life, that's what I get to be. I get to be his dad. And again, it made me feel like a million bucks to know that out of all the people in the world, God chose me to be his dad. And the same thing is true. You know that if you've been chosen for something, if, you, if you've experienced anything like that or anything even cooler than that, to know that you've been chosen is an unbelievably tremendous blessing. And what Paul is telling us here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, is that if you are a Christian, you have been chosen. You have been handpicked by the high king of heaven. I want us to just think about that for just a moment. That God, the creator and sustainer of all things, scripture tells us that he holds the universe together. That he sustains and, and upholds all things. That he chose you. He chose Hunter. He chose me to be his. It, and it says before the foundation of the world, he chose this. He made this decision. Think about that for a moment. That before sin ever entered the picture, before creation was ever created, before your mom and dad were, even knew each other, before your mom and dad decided to have you, all of this was before the foundation of the world. God chose you. He chose me. He chose us to be his. You know, this is, when I think about this idea of being chosen, it's unbelievably humbling, but it makes me so unbelievably grateful. This truth about being chosen, it's an antidote for pride because he chose us. He was the one who made that decision. It's a truth that it's an antidote to shame because he chose us. He wasn't obligated to, but he chose us, regardless of what we have done, are doing, or will do, that he made a decision for us to be his. And it's an antidote to insecurity because he chose us. He chose me, knowing all that I am and knowing all the ways that I would run from him, he chose me to be his. And what has God chosen us for? He tells us we've been chosen to be transformed. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless. And one of the privileges that I have as a college pastor is I get to walk a lot of students through decisions that they're making about their life. As they're trying to figure out what job do I do or what, uh, who should I marry or should I take this job or should I move to that city or what should I do? What is God's will for my life? And a lot of times we get so down in the, in the, in the details and the nitty gritty of making these decisions that we forget the big picture that God has revealed. God hasn't revealed to us if I should be a doctor or if I should be a teacher. He hasn't told us that in his word. But what he has told us is what he wants for our life and what he is doing in our life. He says this, if you've ever wondered, what is it that God wants for my life? Here it is, that we or that you should be holy and blameless before him. That's what God's doing in your life. He's making you to be holy and blameless. God's goal in salvation is that a sin-stained and guilty people would be presented before him as holy and blameless because of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. That's what God is doing in the world. That's what he has been doing. He's been bringing that into the world. He brought it into the world. And now he is, he, he is applying that, that life, death, and resurrection of Christ to us. He's removing the guilt, washing us clean. That we would stand before him as holy and blameless. That we would be like Jesus. 
And he does that in two ways. One is in conformation, and one is in transformation. So conformation comes from the outside in. God conforms us with circumstances, circumstances in our life. Here's an example. This week I've been learning how to process grief. I lost a dear friend a while ago, and I, I don't think I understood how to grieve. I didn't understand how to grieve. But I didn't know how to grieve with other people either. And so in this process... As I have been learning how to do this, I understand finally what it looked like for Jesus in John 11 to weep with Mary and Lazarus. I understood what it looks like now to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. It's not a circumstance that I wanted, not a circumstance I asked for, not a circumstance I would wish upon anybody else. But it's a circumstance that God has used in my life to shape me to be more like Christ. God also does this work of transforming from the inside out. Conforming happens outside. Transforming happens inside out. So what God does with us when we repent and believe in the gospel, he begins to transform our mind and transform our heart. He gives us a new mind, and he changes the way we think about the world. I told you earlier that I wanted to be a businessman. When I was in college, my dad and I started an investment business, and I would drive around Bowling Green looking for empty lots or looking for houses for sale, thinking about, I wonder how low I could buy this house, do a little bit of things on the inside, or rather pay somebody to do some things on the inside, because uh, I don't know how to fix anything, and then sell that house for more than what they were selling it for to make a little bit of money. I was wanting to flip houses. I used to look at the stock market and think, how can I predict which is the next Google or the next Apple? How do I find these things so that I can make a lot of money? And not that those are bad things, uh, but those are, those are earthly, temporary things. And my mind was set on earthly, temporary things. But when God made it clear to me that my life wasn't for me, that my life was for him, he began to change my, the way that I think about the world. He began to change my mind. I can't tell you the last time I've driven around Bowling Green looking for a house to flip. I can't tell you the last time I've looked at the stock market. Again, those are important things, and we need people who are doing that. But in my, in my, in my perspective, that was all that mattered. And now what I understand that matters is that every person is a soul who will live forever. And now, I, not, because I'm a, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a Christian, I'm making my aim in every conversation to talk to people about Jesus. Because their eternity is at stake. He began to change my mind. He changed the way that I processed the world. But he also changed my heart. And he gave me a new heart. Gives me new desires. And he gave me a a, a change in what I loved. If you're a Christian in this room, you should have experienced the same thing. That you once loved sin. And you once indulged in sin. You once delighted in sin. You once even maybe pursued sin. But now in Christ, because you have had a new heart, he's taken out your dead heart of stone. He's given you a new heart. The thing that you used to once love now makes you weep. The thing that you used to go looking for is the thing that you loathe when you find. Like That's what God does in our hearts. He he changes everything about us. And please make no mistake about this. God loves you as you are. Absolutely. Your faults, your flaws, your sins, your scars. He loves you as you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you there. And he just simply won't do it. He won't leave you where you are. He has saved you to transform you. There's a a verse. God has a a plan for our life. There's a verse, Romans 8, 28 and 29. Romans 8, 28 is one of the, the verses that often goes on coffee mugs and Uh, is in very feel-good types of things. And it is a verse that makes us feel good, but oftentimes we only get half the truth. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. A lot of times that's where it stops. And that's a good truth, but it's only a half truth. God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And what's his purpose? Verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son in order that he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brothers. What God is doing in your life, what he's doing in my life, is conforming us and transforming us to be like Christ. And I don't know if you are like me at all, um, but I often find that I'm a long, long way away. I'm a long way away from being like Christ in my thoughts, in my affections, in my actions. And sometimes that can be really discouraging. But I want to encourage you with this promise because of our God, because of how good he is, because of the planner that he is, I want to encourage you with this promise. This is the sort of promise that just continues to motivate our, our, our diligence, our faithfulness, our obedience to Christ, our pursuit of holiness. We do that because of this. Philippians 1.6, Then I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. God will not leave you where you are. 
He loves you way too much to leave you there. He has a plan for your life to conform you, to transform you, to be like his son, that you might stand before him and be holy and blameless. That is a wonderful, wonderful truth. So in verse 3, we saw that God has blessed us with salvation. In verse 4, we see that God has chosen us to transform us. And in verse 5, we see that God has adopted us. God the Father has adopted us. And this is the third truth. That God the Father reveals himself as one who has adopted us into his family. He's adopted us into his family. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 says this. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. I don't know if, again, if you're like me at all or not, but as soon as I read that verse, the very first time I read it, my mind went laser focused to predestined. And everything in me was like, I don't know how I feel about this. But it's a, tr- it's a word that's in the Bible. And so it's a word that we have to start to deal with. We have to unpack because it's something that's revealed to us in God's word that this is the way that God has worked. And now there's two ways to understand how this predestination happens. Option one is to look at it and say that, you know, before the foundation of the world, God looked down through the corridor of history and he knew who was going to choose him in return. So he chose them. So that was, he predestined them because he knew what they were going to do. It's about God's foreknowledge, but the emphasis is on the human responsibility. The the emphasis is on that. The human is going to take the responsibility to make this decision. The other way is to look at it from the sovereignty side and to say, simply as it's said in the scripture, that God chose. Before the foundation of the Lord, he predestined because of the purposes of his own grace. Nothing in us, nothing that we have done or could do or a decision that we might or might not have made but that he chose us, he predestined us, and so now he has given us the faith to believe, to respond in repentance and faith. But what the Bible does do is the Bible does teach us that both of these things are true. Even though one is is heavier focused on the emphasis on the the, the responsibility of humanity, and the other one is on the, the, the emphasis is on the sovereignty of God, what the Bible does is puts these two things together. That that these things, in the way that we think, these are mutually exclusive. How can God be sovereign and also I be responsible? The answer is yes, that's true. That's what the Bible teaches. And again, I recognize that we're uh, sort of wading through some treacherous waters because this can cause a a, a lot of tension. It can cause a lot of debate. This isn't meant to cause debate. This is meant for us to say, wow, God, you are unbelievably good. But there's a, a, a... There's a truth here that we have to affirm, that yes, God is sovereign, and yes, I am responsible for my salvation. The Bible affirms these words. The Bible tells us these words, and so should we. Pastor Jason shared with me an illustration a few years ago uh, that I want to share with you that helps me to understand how this works. Uh, And if you notice, uh, it's a fuel goal, not the best artist in the world, um, but I thought this, this might be helpful for you. And we'd be glad to share it with you some more and and to walk you through it a little bit more in detail if you'd like. But think about a field goal post. Um, In football, where do you score? When it goes through the uprights. You don't score when you kick it out to the right or you kick it out to the left. You only score when it goes to the uprights. Does it matter if you dink it off of one side and it goes in or dink it off the other side and it goes in? No, it still counts. So what we have to do, and this is, I think, helpful for us as Christians, is to understand the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man like this. That on one side of this, you have the sovereignty of God. You think about verses like John chapter 6, verse 37 and verse 44. Scriptures that tell us that Jesus, his words, he said, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me. So we see very clearly there's an emphasis on sovereignty. That God is the one who is doing this supernatural work. He chose, he's the one doing the drawing. But then you also have verses like Mark chapter 1, verse 15, when Jesus comes on the scene and begins his ministry, he says, repent and believe for the kingdom is at hand. That repent is a command that you and I are responsible for. And you think about verses like Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. The emphasis is on the responsibility of humans. And so when I, like the way that I've come to understand this is that, yes, God is sovereign, but the way that I, that I teach people and, compel, and have conversations is to compel people to repent and believe. Because we are responsible for our choices and God is sovereign. And as long as we're staying within the uprights, then we're in good shape because we're staying within the bounds that the Bible has drawn. Where we start to get in trouble is when we start to lean too heavy on one side or lean too heavy on the other side. If you notice up there, on one side we have what's, what's called humanism. 
Humanism is on the, the responsibility of man's side. Humanism is a worldview. It's a belief that says, that I am totally, God is totally detached from me. I make the decisions about my life. There's a, a quote. I don't know if you can read it. It's from a poem. This poet, I used to think this was a really cool uh, idea until I understood it. it's not true at all. But the poet wrote, I'm the captain of my fate. I am the master of my soul. Again, the Bible doesn't present that as an option. The Bible presents God as sovereign. So, so we have to reject this notion of humanism that God is totally removed and it's all on us. But at the same time, we have to reject this idea of, of what's called fatalism. Or maybe another word is determinism. That everything has been predetermined, that I'm just a robot. Every action, every decision, every word that I say has just been predestined and I have no responsibility. Again, not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that we, we are responsible for our choices and God is sovereign in our salvation. And again, how does this work? That's a really good question. People have been talking about this for two millennia now, trying to figure out how these things work exactly. But the focus of our time this morning is not on soteriology. It's on understanding who our Father is. And what Paul makes us very clear, uh, makes very clear to us here in verse 5 is that God is our Father. It's not just a concept that he's just Father as if he's in some sort of hierarchy, but he is our Father in that we are his children that he has brought us into his family. He's given us a new identity as sons and as daughters. And with that new identity comes a whole host of blessings. We've talked about some of them. But it's a little bit of a challenge at times for us to to really experience that identity. I was reading a a story this week about a a woman who had gone through the adoption process. She and her husband had uh, adopted a little boy from China. And she wrote in her, in her blog about um, just the wonderful blessings, some of what we've already talked about already, about uh, this little boy who's going to get to experience. He's going to get to come to America. He's going to get to have a new life here. He's going to get to gain brothers and sisters. He's going to have a, a mom and a dad. Right? He's going to have all these wonderful things that he wouldn't have had access to in the orphanage back in China. But she said it, it, takes, it took him a while, and it's still taking him time, to learn how to be a son to learn how to be a part of their family. Here's what she wrote. She said, For two weeks we walked everywhere in the fourth largest city in China with a not-so-steady Chinese speaker in tow. I would hold his hand as tight as I could every time he started to stumble, but his instinct was to let go. As he stumbled, his little hand would go limp and slide right out of mine. He had to learn to come to us when he needed something. He had never had anyone to depend on but himself. As I read that, I thought, man, that's exactly where I think some of us are. It's exactly where I am sometimes. I struggle to depend on God. We like to be self-dependent, self-sufficient people. And we struggle at times to, to really live in our identity. We, we sometimes get this idea that, that I can provide for myself, that God's too busy. He doesn't, he, he doesn't have time for what I'm doing. The scripture here tells us that God is our father, that he has adopted us into his family. And part of the process of learning to become a child or learning to live as a child of the Heavenly Father is learning to trust Him. Learning to to go to Him when we're in need and not just try to depend on ourselves. Learning to depend on Him. Learning to, to go to Him, not so that we'll live on our own, but that we'll experience Him as our Father who provides, protects, encourages, admonishes, guides us, doing all of the things that a good Father does. And look, I understand there's some of us in this room who... Our, our experience with our earthly father has made it tough for us to see God as a good heavenly father. You may have had an experience with your earthly dad that pushed you away from God or makes it much more harder, much more difficult for you to see God as a father who loves and provides and cares. But I want to remind you this morning of the great links with which God has, has gone to to bring you into his family. And then I want to connect that to a, a statement that the Apostle Paul writes. But Remember what God has done to bring you into his family. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus, clothed in flesh to live, to die, to rise for our forgiveness so that you and I might be brought into the family. Christ died so that you and I, orphans, could become sons. That's what God has done. And Romans 8.32 tells us this. How, or he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is the confidence that we have in our Heavenly Father. He's, he didn't spare his own son. Again, he paid the expense in full that you and I might experience life as sons and daughters of the high king of heaven. 
This week, uh, our staff went on a staff retreat, and uh, we, we shared some stories about our salvation. We shared some story about, uh, stories about our ministry experience, some moments that were marked by joys, moments that were marked by pains. And what we kept coming back to over and over was this idea of what a, what a joy it is to be our Father's child. And I want to encourage you this morning, again, as we've been talking, to revel in that. What a joy it is to be our Father's child, to be a joy that's unlike anything else. To be a child under the high king of heaven. Don't get identity amnesia. Don't forget who you are because of what God has done for you in Christ. And so as we conclude this morning, I'll kind of wrap this back up. But what we've seen, this is, this is who our father is. He's a, a, a generous and a gracious blesser. He's blessed us with redemption. He's chosen us before the foundation of the world. He chose us that we would be transformed into likeness to Christ. He's adopted us as his children and given us the joy of being his and why has he done all of this? Like what, what was the reason? What was the purpose? Verse 6 tells us, to the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he's blessed us in the beloved. The reason that God has done this is for his glory. It's for his praise, for his honor. Yes, yeah, certainly we get to benefit from it, but it's about him. Our lives are about him. It's about what he's done. It's about just rejoicing and embracing and experiencing and celebrating all that God is and all that God has done. And so our call to response this morning is very, very simple. Oftentimes we come to a text and we want to look and see like, okay, here's what the text says, now here's what I do. This is one of those that we can kind of take a step back from that. This is one of those that's just a, a truth that's just meant to just kind of wash over you, to make you feel like a million bucks, to know that this is who your father is. And I want to uh, invite you, though, as an act of response, to do the same thing that we see the Apostle Paul doing at the beginning of verse 3. So Paul says, at the beginning of this, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's ascribing praise and honor and glory and thanksgiving to God for what he's done. So as we finish this morning, I want to read from Psalm 103. That's all about blessing the Lord. And I want to invite you to stand with me as I read this. You're welcome to read it verbally with me if you'd like. The words will be on the screen. You can read it in your heart with me if you'd like. But I want to just invite you, if, this, if these truths are true of your life, if you've repented of your sins and trusted in Christ for salvation, the only right response is to bless God, to praise him for what he's done. And if you're here this morning and you're not so sure about this whole Christian thing, I want to just encourage you to take some time to listen to the words of this, the way that God has blessed us. And allow those words to really spark your mind, to spark your interest. I'd love to talk with you after the service. I'd love to encourage you, to pray with you. But let's read this together, if, if you'd like. Psalm 103, verse 1, start, starts like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He does not deal with us according to our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's pray together. Oh God, we are so, so, so grateful for the blessing that you have lavished upon us in Christ Jesus. The blessing of forgiveness that we couldn't earn. The blessing of freedom that we could have never won. The blessing of filling us with the fullness of joy, something that nothing in this earth can satisfy. We thank you that you have lavished your grace upon us in Christ Jesus. We thank you too, Lord, that it was from before the foundation of the world that you chose us, that you predestined us for adoption to yourself. We recognize that you are sovereign in our salvation, that you are the first mover. And we also thank you that you've given us the faith to respond in repentance and faith. 
We thank you too, Father, that you have adopted us into your family at the cost of your own son. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus was the cost that was necessary for us to be redeemed and reconciled to you and brought into your family. And I pray, Lord, as we have talked this morning, that these truths about you would help us to see ourselves rightly. That as we look at you and all that you are and all that you have done, that we would recognize the wonderful position that you have put us in. Not because we've earned it or deserve it, but simply because you have chosen to love us. We thank you, Father, for all of these wonderful truths. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who is in us. And we ask you, God, that you would help us this week as we try to live in, in light of what we've heard. That we would live with a sense of joy, a sense of gladness, a sense of hope, a sense of purpose. As we understand these things of what you are doing and have been doing and will continue to do until you see us home. And we thank you, God, that you are faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us that you are a God who is faithful. And you will surely do this work of sanctifying in our lives, of making us to be more like Jesus. So thank you, God, and help us as we try to live in such a way that is honoring and is a blessing to you for the same way and in response to the blessing with which you have blessed us. You are so good to us, and we are so, so thankful. We pray all this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our King. Amen. Let's sing this together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. One more time. So bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. I will worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. So, Father, may that be the cry of our hearts today, that when we leave this place, we would glorify you by living a right life according to your word, setting a great example for who you are and the love that you bestowed on us, God. And we ask that you would empower us by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, thank you guys for being here this morning. Y'all are dismissed. Thank mm-hmm. you.